Divine Truth Information Jesus, Mary and others provide information to people and organizations who inquire about Divine Truth teachings. Jesus and Mary answer general questions asked by Jonathan Samuels, an Australian correspondent for Sky News UK. The information was provided on the 10th of May 2013 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is session one. Yeah. Yeah. You want to stand yeah. here? Uh, you can we just make it? You can just make it. 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 You can just make we, we, we prevent, present a lot of material without an audience, so we've, we started, doing we've started doing that lately. Yeah, yeah I've seen one of those actually, you almost interview, you sort of interview AJ. Yeah, 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 where we do stuff Sorry. like that. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and we do that down at Igor and Lena's house, they've got a little corner that they've set up in a room. Studio. It's like yeah. a, almost like a studio. Yeah. And, and so we can present a lot of information like that. So the main reason for having seminars is primarily just to um, really just to to link up with people <coughs> and and answer their personal questions really because yeah. the presentation of the material we can now do using different methods yeah we just started to much more effectively that way. Mm. because obviously when people are asking a lot of questions you can lose the yeah. It kind of can get a bit meandery, and sure. it's good if we just present a lot of truth in one. Right, rather than um, being, being sort of sidetracked. Yeah. 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 And that way we get to present material uh, without an audience. That just gets straight onto YouTube, yeah. and we provide discs of the information as well, yeah. and USB sticks and stuff yeah. like that, and then uh, which anybody can have for free. And then, and then what we do at the seminars which are also free it's more of an individual interaction with people um, so that's the main so you'll find tomorrow it's like a lot more not wide enough it's well, a little bit more disjointed the, the subject material will be presented but um, it's a little more disjointed yeah, than what I'd I'd like it to be because there's interaction with like the audience and yeah. 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 as well and they might it's kind of yeah. maybe yeah. 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 well at least one little bit yeah the camera's around the camera yeah you might have to drive your car down to pick up your camera. Yeah. You can drive your car down. You I tried you? running up the hill. It wasn't very successful. No, no. I'm about halfway. It's pretty, it's pretty steep. <laughs> Steeper than it looks like. It is. Yeah, I'm not as fit as I used to be. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. It's the Aussie lifestyle. You see too many barbecues and <laughs> lounging on the beach. Yeah. Did you get to go to the beach, mate? Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> this is why you're so jealous. Yeah. Yeah. The um, the seminars are, are great for just connecting with people, probably. Mm. Isn't it? Mm. Yeah. And nice, nice to have a bit of an audience because uh, that's the thing about YouTube and stuff. Is you get, I mean, you'll get emails and that sort of thing, but it's nice to actually. We do, but we don't get that many now because they realise that I don't answer many. <laughs> so. Um, the main reason is that it's just too hard to answer thousands of emails uh, in the course of a week and still have a life. So, yeah. so the seminars are sort of people's opportunity to ask questions. Yeah. Along with, we have a thing called a frequently asked questions uh, channel as well, which where people, where if, they, if people ask us a lot of questions that are similar, we can put those questions okay. in. That's oh, John, yeah. Just last thing, have you got anything to the balance when we get yeah. the most changes? Yeah. Doing a bit of just wipe from here, is that? Yeah, that should be fine. Thank you. Sorry, guys. Just there, it's fine. This is kind of easy. I've somehow locked it. Oh, that's. These new buttons. Yeah. So it's new for you, this camera. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of buttons. Yeah. I mean. So does Sky News provide you with equipment? Or did you, um, well, I don't, I'm here on my own, so uh, oh, okay. it's just me on my own, basically. Yeah. So if I need cameramen, I hire them in on a freelance yeah. basis. Yeah. And then it's up to the crew whether they have their own kit or whether they hire Hiring. in. And, and Chris um, hires, hires, hires his kit. Yeah. It means he can use different cameras for different jobs. Yeah. Yeah. 
turn that around now if it's getting into the okay. cable on the wind. Okay? Sure. So I'll do a two shot of you later, I'll just keep it okay. as a two basically. Yeah? So is it, is it, do the whole interview as a two? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Do you want to or do you not want to? No, that's mm. fine. Just yeah, whatever yeah. you want to do is fine. Okay, that's fine. I mean, if you want to mix and match a little bit, that's, that's fine as well. Okay. Sort of, you know, do, do, do a, a close on AJ and then a close on Mary and a okay. wide, you know, I don't mind. Okay. It's just a bit difficult when they're quite close together. It's okay. just sort of, yeah. <laughs> no, I'll see, I'll see, I'll see we what we get. I'll see what we get. Because I can, I can zoom with this lens, so we'll just see what we get. Okay, we'll, we'll start, let's start on a two. And, and if you want to chip in, or you know, if I ask you a question and you want to chip in, or vice versa, then. Sure. There he goes, anyway. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. okay. But I didn't know, because I'm not mic'd, if that's an issue. I'm going to try, yeah, I think I'm, we'll pick you up between the two mics. Sure. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Do you want yeah. me to put this mic across? Yeah, that, that might help actually a bit. So just move it across the support to you. It's so quiet here as well, but it shouldn't be fun. How's that? So, so we need you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, and if you're happy to look at me, that, that's great. Sure. And, and I guess, so are you, are you yep. good to go? Great. Um, so I'm from the UK, obviously. And for people in Britain who uh, don't know about you and don't know about what you're trying to do, can you just explain who you are and what it is that you're, you're aiming to achieve? Well, I'm Jesus, and but what I'm aiming to achieve is to um, show people how to have a personal relationship with God without having any mediator between them and God, and also to uh, become at one with God eventually. That's the that's my purpose of demonstrating the the benefits of becoming at one with God, and what that means. And so. What we, we do, Mary and myself, is we teach divine, what we call divine truths to people, the truth of, of the universe, which are, which are practical truths that help a person go through their day-to-day -day life, but also that help them develop a relationship with God rather than just having thoughts or ideas about God without having a relationship with God. So that's our primary thing that we do. The, the main reason why we do that is we feel that a lot of the world's religions have lost this concept of a personal relationship with God and as a result of that have also lost the concept of loving one another as well and so we see so much sectarian violence and other things like that on the planet and and my primary concern is to if, if we can demonstrate how to reconnect to God and reconnect to God's love in particular and have part of God's love inside of our soul, then we will we'll, we'll start seeing each other as brothers and sisters again, uh, rather than seeing each other as enemies that we need to fight or be afraid of. So, um, so you're Jesus, but you're not, and you never have pretended to be God, have you? You've never no. said that you're God. No. Um, in the first century, I never said I was God. Um, it, it, you know, the Bible quotes differently in some in some translations, but uh, the reality is, I never said I was God in the first century, and I've lived two thousand years of life. I've never been God, and I never will be God. Um, I'm just a person, a man, just like you're a man, and uh, I'm a human. Um, and and what I'm trying to do has always been what I've trying to do for the last two thousand years, and that is to help people understand the truth about a relationship with God. And, and help, help everyone understand that we are all God's children and that we can all have a personal, beautiful personal relationship with God that will transform our entire life. And, and in the first century, I became at one with God through that process that I'm teaching people now. And we're hoping to illustrate the same thing again in this life, uh, that we've come to, to, to illustrate the same principles because we feel the principles have sort of been lost to, to the world for, for a long period of time. It's due, due to a lot of uh, teachings being made around what men have written rather than what we actually taught. Mm. And, and how, did you, how did you realize that you were Jesus? When did that happen? Well, I've had memories of, of my life uh, over the last 2000 years in this life ever since I, I can remember. So from the time I was around two years of age, I could remember specific events from my entire life, but I never really uh, put any store in them, I suppose you could say, until around about nine or so years ago when I went through some processes, emotional processes, where I came to realise that all of these memories that I had were all about my life for the last 2,000 years. And now, and once I engaged that process uh, willingly, and once I engaged it with a op more open heart instead of trying to, you know, to deny it all, 
then all of my uh, all of my memories keep returning, and as a result, I can remember the, that two thousand year period of my life, and and so that and the the memories tell me who I am basically. It's a bit like your own memories tell you who you are. And so, what, what sort of things that people will know from from reading the Bible or understanding? What, what, what do you what do you remember? And, and, what, and what what were the things that have had the most impact on you? In my life now, or no, it's, it's, in, in the last two thousand yeah, years? And um, well, the events probably that had the most impact upon me in the first century were uh, events that occurred during my childhood, which where where people who claimed to be the Messiah at the time were were hung and uh, by the Roman army um, up on crosses uh, in my own hometown, and this kind of uh, it, these kind of events caused me to see that that this whole con concept of conflict between humanity, humans and other humans, was something that I wanted to avoid and something that I felt that I needed to address in, in myself, you know, the reasons why. And so I started to learn principles of forgiveness and those kind of things, so that had a great impact on me. And I remember my life in the first century through my teenage years and, and my 20s. Uh, which are not recorded in the Bible. Uh, neither are the years before I was 12 years of age recorded in the Bible. And I remember all of those areas, and there's so many area, areas there, you know, it's hard to tell a li life in five minutes. But uh, there are so many events throughout that, throughout that life that had a large impact on me. But probably the biggest event was my becoming at one with God in the first century. And the second biggest event would have been meeting Mary. <laughs> and that would have been probably the second biggest event in my life that I can, you know, that, that I can remember with, with clarity. I remember all the events with clarity, but that, that are the biggest events that, yeah. that had an effect on my life. And obviously uh, our relationship is not recorded accurately in the Bible. Uh, the fact that we were married and uh, at the time of your death we were, we were married and that that you weren't celibate and all of those kinds of things so yeah. so um, and like mary was pregnant with my child when i died and and uh, and then of course after we passed obviously we had a very interesting life in the spirit world uh, which um which had was punctuated by specific events uh, firstly my death and mary's death were separated by around 35 years or so and so um for me one of the best parts of the spirit world was when Mary arrived <laughs> in the spirit world with me after uh, she was tortured to death in the, in the first century like I was and um, yeah, and you met some character, uh, you know amazing characters from history didn't you in, in that and tell me, tell me about that well I feel the, the most amazing characters I've met in history are characters that are not recorded in history actually um, you know there we have a lot of friends in the spirit world who um, who basically are unknown here on earth or were unknown when they lived on earth um, and they probably are the ones that we've spent most of our time with but but of course throughout history you get to meet a lot of people in 2000 years and uh, and so i've met a lot of people who, who people today view as famous as well um, but but I don't really see them as any different to any of the other people that i've met yeah. including myself like, like who? I mean, who, who, who. Like who? <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've met people like Plato, Socrates. Um, I've met, uh, you know, the, the people who killed me in, in the Sanhedrin. And many of them became Christian after they entered the spirit world. Um, so I've met many of the people that were on the Sanhedrin who were responsible for my death. Um, I've met through it from then on almost every pope that ever passed. Um, Mostly they were in the hills when I met them uh, trying to assist them to get out of the hills because of the choices that they had made while they were on earth. Um, but also met many what people I would say historically would call famous famous people, presidents and so forth. But I don't see them as any different to any other person and so I, I don't sort of view it as a as an important thing no no no, no. no it's fascinating it is fascinating though mm. but, but i can see how are you okay Chris? yeah i'm gonna move from, okay. get you in now well, and, and yeah. I, I suppose you know the most harrowing part of of your life would have been the crucifixion and is that something that that you remember or is that something that that's sort of been blanked or i mean what, what are your memories of that no i have very clear memories of the crucifixion but it wasn't as harrowing for me as it was for mary and others who were present 
when you're at one with God, you're not in a state of fear and you have quite good control over your body sensations and, and the level of pain that you absorb from your body. So for me, in the first century, my death wasn't as harrowing as what Christians generally or the Bible generally depicts. Um, many of the things that happened that, like, uh, that are depicted in a movie like Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ happened, but the, my personal pain was not as great as that depicted because it, because there are ways to control your body's pain. And so it was more painful probably for the people I left behind than it was for, for myself at the time. And mm. um, so I, I feel in some ways when I recollect all of these events, um, some ways I feel Mary's uh, passing was, was much worse than mine. Um, her, her torture happened over many days, whereas all of my torture happened within six to eight hours generally of fairly intense torture but for Mary it was intense torture for a long period of time and other people historically have had much worse deaths than I have had um, and have had much more pain than I've had in their passing so yeah I don't sort of see the past my passing as a, anything major except for the fact that somebody killed me because they wanted me off the scene you know? um, which is very very much obviously in stark contrast to the the common Christian belief that Jesus' death is the thing that saves them from all sin. Mm. And in fact, that's not the truth at all. No. We're all responsible for the things that we do. And it was actually his life and uh, what we're trying to teach now that teaches people how to deal with those things. Um, and and this your, so, so tell me about your experience of the crucifixion. Then. I mean, obviously you remember it. And, yeah. and that's helped you now to, to teach that philosophy to, to, to people who, who listen. Well, not so much my memories of the crucifixion, but uh, my memories of the teaching that we did in the first century and what a personal relationship with God, what that gave me in terms of knowledge. That's really what is the basis of what we teach now. But the crucifixion was a very, um, yeah, it was a very difficult memory to um, face and I haven't really finished facing it, I suppose. Um, for me, it feels very personal. I haven't been raised in a Christian uh, household this now. <laughs> and so um, for me, it feels like the death of a husband, my husband and the torture of my husband and the loss of the most important person in my life. And, and yes, there's the, some of the typical scenes that you see depicted of the crucifixion. Um, sure, they have emotions attached to, to them for me, but mainly it's just a very personal a feeling of having lo of losing and watching someone that I love be killed. But, but you remember being there, I suppose. Yes. Yeah, yes, even very much yes, so. Yeah. Yes. And, and that must have been horrific. Yes. Yeah. 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 It was very traumatic at the time, and I was pregnant at the time, and um, yeah. I don't know what else to say about that. Yes, it was traumatic. Yeah, yeah. 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 And but we've but had many experiences so much... since then too. Like we've had two thousand years of experiences. Yeah. Not, you know, to us, while it's a focus of people who, who you know, asking questions about the first century seems to be a bit of a focus of people. Yeah. Um, although not many questions have really been asked about the first century, but. Um, there's really 2,000 years of memories that we have about all sorts of experiences that are much more powerful than those experiences that we had on Earth. But yeah. but I suppose it's because people on Earth don't relate to those experiences yeah. that cause them to ask more about the experiences in the first century or now in comparison to the gap that's in between, which is the majority of our yeah. life. Yeah. 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 yeah, and my first century memories uh, I, I, like I have memories from childhood, adolescence, my 20s, marriage, my husband's death and then beyond that. I understand that most people ask about the crucifixion because that's their symbol of Christianity but it's certainly not the, the major part of what lets me know that I'm Mary Magdalene. And also it's not uh, any major part of our teaching at all actually. It's not, it doesn't actually hold any part of our teaching really <laughs> because uh, what we're teaching are principles of divine truth that affects the, the life of the individual the human soul the spirit body and the material body it affects god's laws how the universe operates and so for those reasons um things like the crucifixion are basically a, a transitional period in our personal life they're not really something that affects humanity in any way it's like 
any person's death is a transition in their life from one state to another state. But, but any person's death just has an effect at that moment on the lives around them. But a but hundred years later or th uh, 500 years later, generally their death m means little aside from the fact that they've died and people miss them at the time. And, and that's really the way we see our own death. Does it make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Yeah, it does. We see our own death the yeah. same way. Oh, yeah, I'll ask a bit more about that in a second. I suppose mm -hmm. the, the only other question that was really about um, the last 2,000 years, was, which I, I guess a lot of people will want to know about, is um, the miracles. You know, do, do you remember performing miracles? Which ones did you definitely do? Yeah. And yeah. do you do them now? Um, well, firstly, it must be stated that I did not perform miracles. God performed miracles through me. So it, it's about getting into this state of amendment with God before you actually can do the things that God can do through you. And, and also it's at God's discretion, and when I say discretion, God always has a desire to heal people, but, but there are certain conditions under which God would be breaking God's own laws if he healed certain people. So, so you are aware of all of those things when you're in this state. And so in the first century, yes, there were certain miracles, that so-called miracles that were performed. I don't see them as miracles. I just sort of see them as normal things. Um, like which ones? <laughs> well, things like healing the sight of a blind person, for example, healing any physical deformity in a person's body, um, all of those kind of things are definite miracles. There, there were no, I never did anything like multiply the fish, um, that kind of miracle. I never did, uh, I never resurrected any from the one from the dead who had not completely died. When you completely die, you separate, your spirit body separates from a physical body, and once the separation occurs, you can't resurrect the person. If the spirit body is connected to this physical body, you can resurrect the person even though it seems like they're dead. So it just depends on the circumstance under which you could resurrect a person. So under the circumstance where the physical and spiritual bodies were still connected, but everybody had thought they'd died, I did resurrect quite a number of people and in that state, including a friend of mine, Lazarus, who, who most people m mention in the Bible. But um, they weren't actually completely dead. They were, they were entombed or being, being put in the ground while they still had a connection with their, with their physical body. And, uh, and I found that sometimes a bit distressing that people could be buried alive, basically, and then die while they're, uh, they're in, you know, in, their, in their tomb. But uh, and other events, uh, you know, that I walked on water, I never, never walked on water. Um, so there are some of the events in the Bible that I did do and some that I didn't. I never turned water into wine. I didn't actually agree with drinking wine in the first century. So <laughs> um, I, I did go and buy some wine for, for, for a family uh, wedding that I went to uh, at one point in time. But um, I personally never drank wine in the first century and I never ate meat in the first century after the age of 13. So there, there's a lot of things that are mentioned in the Bible that, that were sort of like, you could call them legends that developed trying to compare me with people in prior historical times who were so-called godlike or gods mm. and uh, I never claimed to be god but you know people after I passed started to mix up a lot of teachings and unfortunately distort them and unfortunately in the process of distorting them provide evidence which mm. came from their own imagination yeah. uh, to prove that I was some kind of special unique godlike yeah. person yeah mm. and, and what about now does God ask you now to perform miracles and is it something you can do I'm not in the state yet where I could perform miracles in the way that I want to and there are two ways to perform miracles one way is by having a spirit work through the person to perform a miracle and I don't want to do it that way um, and there are plenty of people on earth who are doing that um, at the moment and um, I want to have a direct connection with God and then perform miracles if God wants to do that through through me and to get back to that state which is the state that I'm working towards again um, once I'm in that state I expect that we'll be able to do things like that um, but again it's at God's as I said, God's mm. discretion, or, or, or really, to put it more uh, carefully, it's to do with God's laws. All of God's laws have to be engaged in order for the miracle to take place. So, mm. um, so I expect that will happen in the future sometime, but um, it requires me first getting back into that same 
connection with God that I had in the first century. Yeah. So that's my primary focus at this point in time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just a couple of other things that I've sort of heard about, which I find quite interesting as well, um, to do with your the current your current teachings. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one is the whole thing about earth changes. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason that perhaps you're living here now, just just tell me tell me about that. I mean, do, do you have do you have a uh, uh, a view that the uh, the world is going to end and that we're in a safe place here? Is that is no. that right? Um, no, that's what the media have portrayed. But my my feelings are the reason why I'm living here is because uh, I moved from South Australia and. Uh, the reason why I moved from South Australia is because I felt that Mary would be here somewhere in Queensland and so I thought I wanted to move closer to where she would be and as it works out I moved to a place that is 70 kilometres away from where she grew up <laughs> um, and, and I also wanted to create a place like this where it's nice and quiet, peaceful, where, where Mary and I could retreat from the world um, to work through our own emotional work that we need to do in order to grow towards God. And, and I wanted to create a place that was like a bit more connected with nature and so forth than living in a town or a city. I lived in a town where I was in, in, the, in South Australia and I wanted to live in some kind of country location. So, so when I first moved here, it was, it was totally driven by all of those kind of things. What's happened though, is that a lot of people have then assumed based on uh, what they've asked me about earth changes. Now, I got, co- I got constantly asked about earth changes up until fairly recently. And the main reason why I feel people ask me about it all the time is that they are very afraid about these kind of events for lots of reasons. You know, historically, Christians have been waiting for the end of days uh, and a lot of other religious faiths have been waiting for the end of days. A lot of uh, new age type of people have been waiting for the some kind of end of days. And as a result of that, there's a very, very strong emphasis on where's going to, what's going to be safe for us to be. Um, now, if I'm asked my personal opinion, I'll give it. So if someone says, do you feel uh, there's going to be some cataclysmic events in the future? My answer to that is yes, I do feel there is going to be some cataclysmic events in the future, mostly because if you look at the laws that are being broken at the moment, the natural laws about governing the way the earth operates and so forth, you can see that that mankind is not in harmony with his environment and this lack of harmony is going to have some kind of kickback sooner or later and and that's the main reason why I believe there are going to be significant uh, events affecting the earth at some point in the future. In terms of um, what those events will be as I've said very often I've got no idea personally I have feelings about them and and I'm very open about telling people my feelings even when I know that that they might not be facts so if somebody asks me my personal opinion I'll give them my personal opinion even though I know it's not a fact what we're teaching with divine truth which is separate to earth changes are facts so you can have a relationship with God you can find out God's laws you can live in harmony with all of these laws you you can develop your soul you you know these are all things that we know for certain but but it's very difficult for any single person to know for certain what's going to happen in the future because there are so many variables Mm. there's literally millions of is it wrong that you you have predicted certain dates haven't you that no I've never predicted a date no I've I'll, when somebody says, when do you think these events will occur? I say, well, they might occur. I'll, you know, I've said, these are my exact words. They might occur, you know, in October this year is my feeling, you know. But, but it's not, um, I wouldn't call that a prediction. I would call that my feeling at the time. And uh, my feelings, as Mary know, on the issue change quite a lot. And which I've stated quite openly in every presentation I've ever given. And in fact, I've often talked to people about why they keep asking me the same questions and not trust their own feelings you know the reality is on the planet at the moment there are billions of people Mm. on the planet who do believe coming events will occur so there'll be something that will occur in the future and um and whether we're all right or not will depend on (laughs) you know we have to wait for the future to come to see and i don't feel that is an important part of what we're teaching i feel that's sort of like a 
Uh, all I'm doing when people ask me those, ask me those kind of questions is just giving them my personal yeah. opinion. People get obsessed, don't they, with, with, with that sort of, and yeah. Hollywood is obsessed yeah. with it. And yeah. yeah. It's an obsessed yeah. Sort of it's, I wish, well, <laughs> I'd love it if people got as obsessed about the other things that we teach about love. Which and, we know are certain. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and ethics and morality and, and how to grow, grow yourself into being yeah. a more loving person. Yeah. I mean, people. interesting on that point about, about being a more loving person, because the soul makes thing is quite, I find quite interesting. Mm. Um, tell, me, tell me about that. I mean, it, it, just tell me about that because I don't understand it. <laughs> In what regard? What, 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 what's it all about? What, 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 it, you, you say that it's very important that we find a soulmate um, and that soulmate, is that, is, that, is that right? Because No, it's not really what I say either. And yeah. um, again, that's, um, I have talk, given a few talks about soulmates, probably five or six talks about soulmates in the 400 hours of right. material, well, yeah. 800 hours yeah. of material. Because yeah. um, I know some of the concern has been about people you know, leaving their families or their partners sure. or whatever. The reality is that each of us are made in such a way that we are one half of a soul. That's the way God made us. And God made us the other half of our soul as well. And at the time that we come to Earth, one half splits away from the other half and incarnates into two bodies, one spiritual and one physical body. And then the other half at some point after that incarnates as well and, and attracts a physical and spiritual body as well. Now these two halves, sooner or later in God's plan, will become one again. Now for many, that means thousands of years later. For some, it means hundreds of years later, and for many, they do meet their soulmates on Earth. And the reality is that every single person can meet their soulmate on Earth. And it, in terms of their future uh, progress, in terms of their everlasting progress, it's important to meet your soulmate. But most people don't. Most people on Earth will meet them and walk straight past them um, because they don't recognise them because of the different emotional injuries they have with the opposite gender. And all we're doing is encouraging people to work through their emotional injuries with the opposite gender. In other words, we want to see, eventually, what we would like to see is that every man has gotten rid of all of his anger with women, all of his rage towards women, all of his fears about women and so forth. And what we'd also love to see is that every woman on the planet has worked through her rage with men and her, his, her fear of men and so forth. And so that we can all live much more harmoniously and equally as you know, on the planet still, the majority of people, uh, men have still, in most countries, got by far more say than women. And, uh, and of course, there is a growing trend towards equality, but there's still quite a lot of inequality, particularly even in Western countries, uh, with regard to payment of wages and so forth. And so we would love to see this, this problem of inequality between the sexes be addressed. And what we're trying to do is illustrate to people that when, when, the, when God created this splitting of the soul, what he was trying to do is help us understand that we are equals. We are actually one half of ourselves is the other gender. And, and it might not in be the, the other gender, it, it, just in the majority of cases, because it could be that the two halves split and attract the same bodies. It just depends on the flavour of their soul. But if everyone addresses this intergender rivalry that seems to be uh, perhaps even developing and, 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 and certainly, uh, it certainly isn't getting healed on the planet, um, then I feel we'd have a lot better outcome on the planet in terms of uh, loving relationships mm. and that's the primary thing we're focusing on and and we do feel quite strongly that sooner or later each person will meet the other half of themselves and recognize the other half of themselves yeah, yeah. and that's probably more you sort of said that we teach that it's important that you find your soulmate <laughs> really the focus of what we're teaching is showing people they have the opportunity to grow in love and develop themselves and discover this true personality that God put into them. And if they do that with love and ethics and... And morality. And morality and desire mm. to know themselves and to be themselves... They will then find their mate. They will find their mate. It's, mm. In fact, it's pretty hard to find your mate without doing that. Right. Mm. So, I, suppose the, I suppose the worry is that... And, and what, you know, the, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know a great deal about what, what you're teaching, so I'm, I'm sort of yeah. asking this from a very sure. basic sure. level. But yeah. I suppose the worry is that if you're if you're telling people who've been married for 20 or 30 years that they've got still got to find their soulmates, and if they're learning about love and morality and all those things you're talking about, actually the person that they've had quite a happy relationship with, 
they might suddenly start questioning that relationship, and then that's that's quite sad, isn't it? Um, well, I don't know why they would start questioning the relationship if they felt they had a fantastic relationship with their partner. Um, to me, it, it, I don't understand why. Like, if if somebody came to me and said, "Oh, you know, you've got a soulmate that's the other half of you," and um, my first presumption would probably be that I probably found her. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Especially if, I had if you're a... very happy and loving each other and yeah, feeling... so yeah, I don't know why a person would not presume that initially and, and then work through the particular issues. So, so to me, I don't really understand why they would go into this real big questioning thing. But, but obviously I feel a lot of relationships have a sort of, there's, there's, there's the surface layer of the relationship and then there's what's really going on in the relationship. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people with relationships don't really get much below the surface layer. And then, of course, when they come along to our seminars, we start talking about the deeper issues that are involved in a relationship. And we've done many, many talks about relationships and how to have a loving relationships and so forth. And people start questioning whether they have a loving relationship. And I don't feel that's a bad thing. I don't agree that you need to leave your partner just because you don't have a loving relationship. In fact. <laughs> in fact, what I teach people is that they need to stay and work through the issues and only leave if the issues are insurmountable or causing so much anger and rage between the two halves, that, between the parties, that, that you know, the relationship is degrading in its mm. condition. Mm. So um, the reality is most people who have come to us have said they've thanked us for keeping their relationship together rather than splitting up their relationship. Mm. And in fact, we know very, very few people who have actually split up a relationship and then found, tried to find somebody else as a result of what we've taught. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I suppose it's just oh, we're losing the light a bit, aren't we? So yeah. I won't keep it much longer. Yeah. I just want to check on. <laughs> talked about everything that I was hoping to. Um, I suppose the only, the, I suppose the only other thing is, you know, I, having read a lot in the in the press and seen the, you know, the TV reports, and there is this whole accusation of a cult and being a cult leader. I mean, how how do you, when people say you're a cult leader, what do you say to them? I think it's very funny, but anyway, <laughs> I in do. It's just, so improbable. It's so improbable. So, um, we, we we have no control over people's day to day life at all. Um, we, we, we live alone, um, when I say we live alone, we live in each other, but um, you know, we don't live with anybody else. We don't tell anybody else what to do. We don't see most of the people who come to our seminars for months at a time, and sometimes for years at a time. So, um, and and all, all, all we really do is present seminars and, 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 and answer people's questions whenever people have questions that they want to ask, and I, and I, and I still, for the life of me, can't understand where the cult things come from. Um, well, I guess it just comes from claiming to be Jesus and Mary Magdalene. People automatically associate that with us wanting to have power or control over others. When in fact, what we teach is each person should be responsible for themselves, their own will. We teach people that their will is their responsibility. So if they were giving it over to us or anyone else, they'd yeah, be damaging themselves. That'd already be out of harmony with my own teachings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, no, um, but you, 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 do you want more? So, I've okay. lost your mic, actually. Oh, have you? Yeah. Okay. All right, don't worry. Well, oh, we're nearly done. It's just the last of okay. it. I mean, do you, want, do you want more? Do you want lots more followers? Do you want lots more people to listen to what you have to say? Or, or does that not? Do the numbers not bother you? Um, as Mary knows, the numbers don't bother me. However, I would love for everyone on the planet to listen to what I've got to say. Otherwise, what, what point would you have in speaking if you didn't want that? If we didn't believe in what we were talking <laughs> exactly. about, there'd be an issue as well. Yeah, yeah, so my feeling is I'd love everyone on the planet to listen to what I say, and not only listen to it, but also put into practice particularly the principles about loving your neighbour and caring for your neighbour as yourself. And, and the principles about experimenting with a relationship with God, you know, not just... Um, assuming that you can't have one and so I, I would love to see people apply a lot of those particular things and I would also love to see people apply a lot of things about the human soul that we teach because a lot of diseases and sicknesses on the planet would disappear as a result of that so um, I'd love lots of people to listen but I'm not um, very attached to lots of people listening and never have been uh, all we want to do is and s share what we feel is the truth with people who want to who have a desire to hear it 
we don't want to force it down people's throats or, or force people into accepting it. We don't want to have any crusade about it. We All we want to do is just share the, share the truth freely with people who want to hear it. And I guess there'll always be people who don't believe you're Jesus. Of course. will be yeah. quite offended by a lot of what you're saying. Yeah, and there were lots of people in the first century who didn't believe I was the Messiah and, and were offended by what I said. And in fact, I died at the hands of some of them. Um, Unfortunately, they didn't learn how to love either. And, and my suggestion is, even if you don't believe that I'm Jesus, at least learn how to love, because lo love is going to affect the rest of your existence. And, and if you truly love, you're not going to want to attack me or, or harm me in any way if you truly loved. In fact, you wouldn't want to attack anybody or harm anybody if you truly loved them. So, so I feel if people applied the principles of what we're teaching, the world would be a far better place, even if they can't accept that, that I'm Jesus and Mary's Mary Magdalene. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'd be happy. We'd be happy if people embraced yeah. that, and yeah. even if they never believed who we were. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're all very admirable things to, to, to be believing in, aren't they? You know, yeah. there's, nothing, there's nothing not to, to, to embrace there, really. And a good, even if you don't believe. You know, yeah, but, yeah, a good 90% of the yeah. people who come to our seminars, probably more than 90%, yeah. don't believe that we're Jesus oh, really? and Mary Magdalene. Yeah. 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 Chris, do you because we've sort of finished the interview, do you yeah, want to get your yeah. shots just Can I get before? you to just come in this way a bit? Because I'm going to shoot that way, so yeah. Sure. OK, cool. I'm just going to get that's a few great, great. So that. that's, yeah. that's cleared up quite a lot of stuff that, you know, I've read about and <laughs> yeah. not quite... Yeah, you know, sort of got yeah. a handle on, but, uh, you know, it's, it's all useful. That's yeah. the trouble with misinformation, is, yeah. that, is that it... Like, in the, in, people end up with so many more questions as a result of misinformation mm. when most of the questions are easily resolvable. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I feel quite saddened sometimes when I see the amount of misinformation on the planet about all sorts of subjects. Mm. Um, because, because without information, you can't really progress. And, and while everyone is so worried about hearing new information, there's a blockage to further progression, even as a human race. Mm. You know? So how, how are you going to expand on this then over the next few years? I mean, how are you going to get that message out more and further afield? Because yeah, we're not that worried about that, actually, Jonathan. It's right. like the, the reason why we're not worried is because the way we feel is that people who have a desire to hear the message will eventually express their desire to hear and they want to know. And because we do everything for free, there's a there's a great um, like there's now 900 hours of videos sitting on YouTube where that they can listen to at any time they want in, a, in their own home, in the comfort of their own home. There's uh, things that we continually give away. The seminars are, are, are provided for free, so there's no we don't need to do anything more. We feel to to give more information to people. What we feel is that people will f find the information through all sorts of ways. And then it will tug on their hearts, some of some of those people, and they'll want to know more, and there's all mm. these mechanisms for them to know more. But with how, however many billion Christians there are in the world, yep. shouldn't you be reaching out to, to every Christian? Yeah, it's an interesting question that most people have asked me, like, shouldn't you be doing this or shouldn't you be doing that? And I see things very differently than most people do. I don't see this as a marketing exercise or an advertising exercise. Mm. I see this as an exercise of firstly changing myself so that I can become a living example of what it's like to be at one with God. Mm. And once people see that example, then they might like to copy it. And once they have a desire to copy it, there's all this free information available to do them about how to do that. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. what I, how I see it. I don't yeah. sort of see it as a a major crusade, sort of crusade that no. I've got to change the world. No. Because, um, because we respect free will so much, we feel that if Christians would like to know about us, then that if they just use their will, <laughs> they'll definitely find us. But if we go impo knocking on church doors and things, we're basically imposing information on people who haven't asked for right. it. Mm. And that would be very much against our mm. personal ethics. Mm. So we, we don't see that we would do that, but I agree We could that never agree to somebody forcing information with us. That's one another. Yeah. yeah. For myself, I feel the more I can live the example yeah. of what we teach, yeah. Yeah, just with yeah. um, I feel more people will be attracted yeah. to it. Yeah. Because, because that's something about how the soul works as well. Yeah, of course. 
you know, the more love there is in a soul, the more people find that magnetic. Mm. But um, I mean, actually, yeah. that was one. Of, that was the other thing I wanted to ask. And, and I, if you're not comfortable answering it, don't, sure. don't worry. But the, the, uh, some, um, one of the things I saw there was the, the aspect of your your sort of family and, and yep. their feelings about you going down this path. I mean, yes. How 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 has that been? How's it? Uh, What's happened? Do you mean, yeah, or how, how do I feel about has it? Has it affected the relationship you've had with your family? Um, I feel that really what's happened with my family is that, ironically, they introduced me to AJ. He was in their living room <laughs> giving a talk about these things, and I happened to meet him. I'd just come back from Beirut, and I was sitting in their living room, and I heard this guy talking. Um, um, and as things progress between us, uh, actually... They kind of also told me, that's right, AJ met me and felt that we were soulmates, but he didn't discuss it with me because he also felt that my will was involved and he wanted, I was no, going I felt Mary had to make up her own decision about mm. all that. Yeah, and certainly when it comes to being reincarnated and having a whole other identity, you don't just sort of land that on someone, you let them do their thing. But my parents found out, not from AJ, someone else, and they told me um, that this is what he felt. and. Me being the tenacious kind of uh, investigative person that I am, I, I sought him out and I said, what's all this about and why didn't you talk to me? Anyway, I got the third degree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, our relationship progressed between us quite gradually. But my parents became very afraid simply because AJ was saying he was Jesus publicly and they by their own admission, feared for what my life would be like. And they also had some fundamental issues with looking at emotions, They've, which is core to these teachings. They felt that was too much. Uh, they didn't actually verbally say that, but that's, that was the message. And they got to a point where they were bullying, they were bullying me so much and they were outwardly verbally abusive to AJ that I felt that I needed to set a healthy boundary really i wouldn't accept that kind of treatment from you so no. why would i accept it from my parents um i can see that it's very much based in their fears but it was also the first time in my life where i had a major difference of opinion with them in terms of not an argument but in terms of you believe this i believe something else i was raised to believe that they always told me that would be okay <laughs> when it happened it wasn't okay and so I, you know, I'm hopeful that one day they might find it in themselves to be able to accept the way we live. But I certainly don't carry ill will towards them, like on, on a day-to-day -day basis. I've had to work through, um, and I'm still working through aspects of that, of the grief of that. But I certainly feel like they forced my hand. Yeah. They didn't. They couldn't accept AJ in my life. Certainly, AJ could accept them in my life. And I couldn't accept what they, the way they were treating me either. So mm. that's what happened. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So I hope you don't mind me asking about no, that. No, that's yeah. fine, because I know it's been spoken about in yeah. other contexts. And again, it's just good to sort of clear yeah. all these things up yeah. for myself. Yeah. 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 I should get a wide shot then. Yeah, quickly. great. If we yeah, just thanks. Go go it does get dark quickly. Yeah. 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 Really yeah. quickly, so we've been nice. looking at really, That was really good. That was great. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks, that's that's yeah. interesting yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting as well that you said about 90% of people who come to the centre of don't believe. And does that bother you? That doesn't bother you. No, not at all. No. And, like, I understand why they might find it difficult, particularly yeah. at this point, because I haven't yet completed what I believe is my transition. Yeah, and I guess when that happens, then, then things will be a whole different. load of things will be different, won't they? Yeah, that's the way of feeling I have. And, um, but, and that's what happened in the first century. I had a lot of people listen to me before I became at one with God who, who you know, basically had the same opinion. You know? Yeah. I, you know, what he's saying sounds interesting, but... I don't think he's the Messiah, you know, that's the kind of statements they made and and it's much the same now, like and I and I understand that and and I understand why I'm people feel that way. But uh, like I don't feel it's even very important either, does that make sense? Like, it's certainly not yeah. the crux yeah. of no, what we're talking if about. people if people are coming, they're coming because they want to hear what you have to say and it doesn't really matter what, what they think about no. you as a person, it's just about you as yeah. Like you.
delivering this message? The only area where we are quite uh, concerned about people who come is that if they come and expect to be able to abuse us, yeah. then of course sure. we draw the line there yeah. and, uh, yeah. and we yeah. ask them to go. Sometimes, it's, it's rare, rare. Yeah. Yeah. we've had a few occasions where, yeah. we've had a few occasions where um, people have yeah, had to be asked to be to leave from from the audience, and some have stubbornly refused, and I've actually stopped the entire seminar as a result. Yeah. But uh, but that is a demonstration of their unloving unloving behaviour, and and it's ironic given the fact that I'm talking about love while they're coming to a seminar talking about love, and then when they're asked to leave, study, yeah. 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 and then when they're asked to leave, they yeah. they don't leave, and and affect the seminar for the for a hundred other people, but and. Um, but generally it's not like that at all. Most people who come are pretty friendly people, um, pretty straightforward, they're all investigative, they ask questions, they're not people who, are, who easily take any answer as an answer. Many of them we've known for five years or more and they still don't believe um, the very first things I said to them. <laughs> but they still keep going along because they're interested in the topics yeah. uh, that we present. So. And do you plan to meet some of them tomorrow? Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Great. yeah. we can come along, yeah. yeah. We won't say the whole thing because we've got a flight. We sure. get the last flight from Bishop. I was just wondering if there's English people there tomorrow. So there are people oh, that'd be curious, actually. There's Luli, she's English. Luli's she's, English? Um, okay. Yeah. She's been here for... She's a... Um, She's a scientist, yeah. a brain scientist. Oh, wow. Neuroscientist. Uh, neuroscientist. Yeah. Um, who else is there that would be English? English. Oh, John. John Swatland. Is he English? John Swatty? No, Lizzie. Lizzie is. Yeah. Yeah. Lizzie is. That's great, actually. Yeah. 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 If I see yeah. that, if I see him, yeah. I'll yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll be able to live here now and move down to Australia. Yeah. 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 Lily lives did her... five kilometres away. Yeah. Yeah. But Lily's lived here for five, six, seven, maybe. She did a post-grad study here, I think. So. Yeah, she lived in Brisbane for five or six years. And Lizzie, yeah, she's been here for probably, I don't know. 20? 20, right. yeah. Mm. Yeah, but there are people in England who... Quite um, a lot. Did you go to the UK much? Did you... I've been there quite a lot, actually. Twice last year? Three times, twice. We gave three talks there last year. Um, and how and do how you fund that? I mean, do, they, do they help pay for the flight and stuff? Yeah, well, the way it's funded is often through people all around the world wanting to come to a visit to their location and so what we finish up well what we finished up doing the last two times is just buying around the world ticket as a and result. They sort of donated and towards each the person sort of donated a bit towards the ticket and then and so yeah, ended up, that ended up and then we finished up staying uh, sometimes with people and sometimes uh, you know in motels and stuff like that just depending on what arrangements they've made and mm -hmm. um, so that's another thing people, 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 people are hung up on, isn't it? The money aspect. It seems to me that you don't, you're not living a lavish lifestyle. You, you get spent time. Yeah, you yeah. get spent time. <laughs> um, right. well, we okay, need candles. So it's going to get dark. But yeah. Like, yeah. I think it's going to be different. I think we should be able to chop anything up. Start heading, no, let's start heading back. Then. Okay. Yeah. I'm happy if, you're, if you guys are happy. Do you yeah. want to film anything else? Yeah. Um, no, I think, I'm, I think we're good. Okay. Yeah, that's great.